I'm Dean. I'm the dad. I'm Laura. I'm the mom. And I'm Chrislyn. I'm the daughter. And together we are Family, Family Plot. Plot. Yay. Uh, so, uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for listening as always. Uh, let's get the housekeeping out of the way. Uh, Patreon, there's really only two levels right now, one and three dollars. Uh, you get cool stuff for doing it. Uh, we greatly appreciate it, uh, and it's a monthly thing, like we said. Uh, if you can't do a monthly thing, uh, you can certainly uh, go through Buy Me a Coffee, which is a one-time donation of a dollar or two. Uh, if you enjoy the show, though, please share it on social media. Share it with friends. Share it with family. Share, share it with, with everyone. everyone. Uh, if you don't enjoy the show, please keep, keep it, it to yourself. And if you can't say something nice, don't, don't say, say nothing at all. at all. Yeah, take that, Disney. Uh, anyway. Disney? Well, Thumper's daddy said it. Uh, yeah, it, it, I was trying to be funny. Uh, sometimes I am. Okay, uh, so what are we talking about today? Well, today... We are going back to 1919 to New Orleans, or uh, to pronounce it correctly, it's New Orleans, uh, to investigate. Huh? Is that how you pronounce it? No, it was the actual French. Um, okay, I'll take your word for it. I took four years I, of high school French. I, I remember some stuff. I know you did. I and was thinking what... about taking French. It's... Stick with Spanish. It really, I mean, if you want to use, if you want to learn more languages later on, absolutely. But I am telling you, especially in our world and our country that continues to expand on our um, Latin and Hispanic cultures, Spanish really is a super, super valid and good skill to have on your resume as you go into the workforce. So if if you can do it, and it seems like you're doing really well so far in that class, I would say stick with that. But that's just my mom info, just trying to be mom encouraging. Spanish isn't bad. It's it's pretty okay. It's not too hard to learn. What? We've sort of gotten off the path a bit here. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> We we were talking about we we haven't even introduced the show yet, and y'all are so deep in banter. Okay, it was your fault because you brought up high school French, which in turn made Krista say high school French, which in turn made me encourage her to stick with the Spanish that she's already in. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> this from the man who's always like, be yourselves. Talk Let's have conversations. Have conversations. Let's talk during the podcast. And now we're in the podcast. We are talking. We're interacting. We're working together. You're grinning like a loon and giving <laughs> us all the hell. What's up with this? Yes. I'm not me if I'm not picking on someone. Come That's on now. Probably true. <laughs> so today we're going back to 1919 in New Orleans. That's where you were. Thank you, uh, magic recorder lady. Uh, th in New Orleans to investigate a serial killer known as the X Man of New Orleans. In this historical true crime, didn't know it had, it had a tie in. To American Horror Show. 
I uh, know. I told you, American Horror Story coming. They they did a show on it. They sure did. Uh, uh, yeah, episode of the Family Plot Podcast. <laughs> but first, but first, just uh. But first, Krista needs to cover her eyes so I can flip her father the bird for being honorary. <laughs> she did. We're so proud. Hi. Hi there. Hi, how's it going? How it's going is, if I haven't told you today, I'm very proud of you. I'm proud of you too, Yay. pumpkin. People are proud of me. Um, Every day, yes. How's it? How's it actually go? How's it actually going? Yes. Going okay. Other than the illness. Oh uh, yeah, that's probably what I was gonna mention. Is that we're all really sick still? Yeah. That's what I was going to mention, is we're all really sick still. There. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Welcome back to Krista's Corner, where the question under discussion is, how is everybody doing? And the thing I wanted to say that I hadn't yet is we're all still recovering from this upper respiratory discombobulative nonsense. nonsense. That keeps cycling through the family. Uh, I blame the other children. Of course, I blame the other children for pretty much everything. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, but uh, yeah, so uh, I, I did want to apologize if we sound a little off. That's mm. probably why. That's something to do. Yeah, if we cough or we sound a little off, I think dad's going to cut the coughing out or try his best. But uh, if you hear a cough. Yep. So, how was school? Uh, it's going all right. I'm overwhelmed, so I'm not motivated, but we're going to try. Doing our best. That's all we can do. Uh, a wise man once said, take each day one at a time. Uh, probably some guy in a movie somewhere. I, I, those or... are the quotes I can remember. I think the turtle said in Kung Fu Panda that yesterday <coughs> is gone. Tomorrow is uncertain. You have to take advantage of right now. It's a gift. And that's why they call it the present or something along those lines. Was that Kung Fu Panda? Yeah. I think it was. Yeah. I thought it was Zootopia. Uh -oh. Nope. No. Definitely Kung Fu Panda. Okay. That was I'm paraphrasing. I know that's not exactly how it goes, but it's something pretty close to that. Okay. All right. He's a wise turtle man. He was a wise turtle. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Very wise. Uh, and flat bracelets are, are the thing. Are the, I'm I'm fidgeting. The They're the fidget toy of the hour. There's a lot of fidget toy over here somewhere. Yeah, I somewhere. wouldn't do that though. Ah, uh, your sister was very excited to get those slap bracelets today, though. So, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, and they're even like plastic coated, not like the ones when we were kids that had material on them. So, like, oh yeah, they're kind they of they can be sanitized. Comfortable. These can be sanitized. I love it. Yeah. Uh, I. Recently hit 2,500 followers on my TikTok. Yeah. Hey, good job, Chris. Maybe that is something for you to consider. What? Just taking a little time each day to document your daily struggles, whatever they are. You, you might feel like you're the only person going through this. But I know that you're not. Yeah. 
and you might help someone else. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you have to do it. I, I'm not even saying, I mean, if it's not something you want us to do, don't do it. I'm just saying it's something you should think about. That's all. Because I think you could help a lot of people. Maybe. <clears throat> My brain is just blank. I am exhausted. We're tired, Krista, and she's been as sick as the rest of us. Yep. Oh, I've got to give her claps. Yep, yep, yep. So funny because that button is right next to that slaps button. And there's I, I, at least you one. You mean this one? Yes, that You one. should have used that earlier or when he was being a pain in the butt. I should have. I didn't even think about it. If, okay, fair to, enough. To be honest, I forget that he actually has abilities for sound effects. And To be honest, me too. I just kind of think we're sitting here and recording. And it's just like, wow, okay. <laughs> It's we, you guys are good, but not that good. So yeah, yeah there's got to be a little magic. <clears throat> mm. All right, that's much better. Hang on. Ah, thank you, dude. Um, where were we? Oh yes, New Orleans in 1918. Uh. In 1918, New Orleans was having a bit of a rough time. The 1917 Mardi Gras had been canceled because of World War I. Uh, in 1918, it would be canceled again, this time due to a Spanish flu outbreak that was burning through New Orleans as it was burning through the rest of the world. Uh, a new music, jazz, was beginning to make its appearance in New Orleans, but the Times Picayune that's a good word, Picayune. You don't hear it much. If you say so. The Times Picayune claimed that jazz added nil to the legacy of music and actually caused harm. They called for jazz to be smothered in its crib before it could grow. Wow, that's pretty awful. Racist much? You think? Hey. Voodoo had long been a part of New Orleans, and it was true in 1918 as well. Mm -hmm. It was into this environment that an independent killer would suddenly capture headlines. Mm-hmm. And here we go. So on May 23rd, 2008, or I'm sorry, May 23rd, 1918, the death of the Maggios. Joseph and Catherine Maggio ran a bar room and grocery on Upper Line and Magnolia Streets. After closing both businesses, the couple went upstairs and slept in their shared bed. At some point, the killers slit both of their throats with a straight razor and bashed both in the head with an axe. Then the killer took off his bloody clothes, put on a clean outfit he brought with him, and left the scene. When Joseph's brothers, who had, an, who had apartments upstairs, came to check on the couple, they found Catherine dead and Joseph dying. Joseph would die before the police arrived. Police would later recover the straight razor on the lawn next door and it was eventually traced to Andrew Maggio. Joseph's, bro Joseph's brother, who had a barber shop nearby. However, Andrew's assistant claimed that Joseph had taken the straight razor to get a nick out of the blade. On the pavement nearby, they found a scrawled message that read, Mrs. Maggio will sit up tonight just like Mrs. Toomey. Most think this is a reference to a 1911 murder where one of the victims was known <laughs> as Mrs. Tony. Modern criminologists do not believe the killings were done by the same killer. Krista, you want to tell us about uh, June 27th, 1918? What does that say? The Bessumer? Bessumer, I think, is how Bessumer. that's pronounced. The, or slash low attack? Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Around 7 a.m., a man who drove a bread delivery van arrived at a grocery store located at the junction of Dorjnois, I believe. Dorjnois? You weren't kidding when you said you were giving me big French words. Dorjnois, yeah. Yeah, okay. And La... La Harp. La Harp, okay. La Harp Streets. And when the owner did not respond to his hail... He checked in the apartment in the rear of the store, only to discover that Louis Louis Yes Yes the Bessumer Bessumer were and Low were lay like lying 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 okay lying in bed in pools of their own blood. Bessumer had been struck right above struck above the right temple while Lo had been bashed in the side of the head. They both survived their attack, and the axe that had been used on... What? Was, was Lewis's, Lewis's own. Police immediately arrested a black man named Lewis O... Ubicon? Ubicon? I, Ubicon is what I believe. Ubicon who had worked for Bessumer some weeks earlier. The police believed it was a robbery gone wrong, but was nothing taken. And Lowe had woken before her attacker struck and claimed her. Attacker was a mulatto, a no longer used term for a person who, while not African American, has African American ancestry. Uh, but police ignored this. Some weeks later, police were forced to release Ubicon because they found no correlating... Corroborating? Cor- correlating's fine. Works there. Okay. I was just like, correlating? No. You're good, baby. Correlating evidence. Some months later, just before a failed surgery, took her own life. Harriet Loeb claimed Bessumer had attacked, had attacked her and the police arrested him. He was tried but acquitted after the jury met for only ten minutes. Hmm. Interesting. So, we go now to August 5th of 1918. Uh, Anna Schneider. Uh, this resident of Elmira <laughs> Street was 28 years old and eight months pregnant when she was attacked. She was struck repeatedly on this scalp and her face was covered in blood. Her husband discovered her a few hours later when he returned from work. The police investigated and found nothing stolen except for six or seven dollars from her husband. <laughs> from her husband's wallet. Woo. Some of these longer passages get to you. I know. I was out in trouble, too. Uh, <coughs> the windows were closed and locked, as was the door. The police believed. The police believed she was attacked with a bedside lamp. That was found later. They arrested an ex-convict named James Gleason, but were forced to release him because there was no evidence against him. He seems only to have been arrested because he was an ex-convict and one of the usual suspects. Yeah, they're doing great so far, I think. <laughs> what a deal. So continuing on, on August 10th, 1918, Pauline and Mary Bruno woke to a commotion coming from an adjoining room where their uncle, Charles Romano, resided. They burst in to find a large, heavy-set African-American man wearing a dark suit and slouch hat attacking their uncle. The man fled. Charles had been struck twice in the head but was able to walk to the ambulance when it arrived moments later. Police investigate the scene and find one of the panels of the black door ha- back door had been chiseled out and a bloody axe was left in the backyard. Two days after the attack, Charles died. The murder began a panic among the residents of New Orleans. 
People begin reporting sightings of the axemen as well as discovering axes in their backyards. It's at this point that tips begin to flood in and the police were simply overwhelmed. Charles D'Antonia, a retired detective, publicly suggested these murders were the work of an individual who was overcome by a mania to murder from time to time. He called him a real Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type. And now uh, let's take a moment for a word from our sponsors. Hey, babe. Yeah, baby. I feel sponsored. Awesome. Uh, How you feel, Krista? I feel sponsored. Yay. Mm -hmm. You feel like reading? I don't, but I'm gonna. I was gonna say, I can take it over for you if you like. I mean, we all hear how much you're struggling to breathe. So if you don't want to do any more reading, I'm I'm okay with that. I you, more I would. Prefer... You have a few, but it's okay. But yours are the smaller. You got this. Come on, girl. Go ahead. Yeah, you say that, but the first word that she's got to come up with is cordomiglia. You just said it. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Cordomiglia. Blah, blah, blah. Cordomiglia. I don't want to say it. Okay. Uh, in Gretna, Louisiana, a, a suburb of New Orleans, screams echoed from the cordomig cord bleh, cordomiglia household. Irlando Jordan. Giordano? Giordano. A 69-year-old grocer came across the street where he saw Rosie Cordomiglia stand. Mm hmm You did perfect. Standing in a doorway with a serious head wound, carrying her di diseased infant daughter, Mary, who, did, who had been killed by a sim single blow to the neck. Lying on the floor was her husband, Charles, also bleeding profusely from a head wound. Rosie and... Charles? Charles. Charles. Okay. Charles were rushed to Charity Hospital, where they bo bo were both diagnosed with treated... Both diagnosed with and treated for skull fractures. Once Rosie recovered, she accused Irlando and his son Frank of attacking them. Something that Charles denied on multiple occasions. At 69, Irlando was too, too frail to have committed the attacks. At, and at six foot tall and over 200 pounds, Frank was way too large to fit through the door panel that had been chiseled away. Um, still, the police arrested them both, and both men were found guilty. Shortly afterwards, Charles divorced Rosie a year later. Rosie recanted, recanted? Mm -hmm. recanted her testimony, claiming to, uh, claiming to have made the accusations based on bad blood between them. And since that was the only thing, the only evidence against the two men, they were freed from jail. Yep. What a deal. <laughs> uh, before we get to this next bit, um, let's take a moment. Uh, Wait, didn't we already do a word from we our sponsor? We did a word from our sponsor. Oh, okay. Then we, I don't know why it's here. Uh, let's move on to March. Do we not have another podcast to promo this week? We do. Oh, is that what we did? We did a word from our sponsor and when we should have done that. Yeah, okay. Yep. I think so. All right. So we'll drop in the other podcast here. Here. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure which one it is this week. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, I'm looking forward to this as much as you guys. Welcome to Brew Crime, a true crime and beer podcast. This is a podcast where we pick a theme, cover a few cases, and pair them with craft beer. Join me, Mike. And me, JT. As we explore the world of crime, conspiracies, or whatever catches our attention. 
You can find us on social media at BrewCrime or our website, BrewCrime.com. And you can find us on any podcast app at BrewCrime Podcast. Join us as we discuss the horrible crimes that surround us and maybe, eh, probably, nah, definitely tip a bottle or two back as you do it. Drink with us the second and last Tuesday of every month. I may have to go check that out after we finish. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that sounds interesting. I'm, I'm in, as they say. <laughs> Uh, as you kids say, I am in. All right. Um, so on March 16th, 1919, uh, the Times-Picayune published a letter purported to be from the murder. The letter, which is usually dubbed the Axeman's letter, read as follows. Hell. March 13th, 1919. Esteemed mortal, they have never caught me, and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians uh, and your foolish police call the Axeman. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall need, leave no clue except my bloody axe, besmeared with the blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. <coughs> if you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as not only to amuse me, uh, his, but his satanic majesty, Francis Joseph, uh, all the rest. Uh, but tell them to beware. Let them try not to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the Axeman. I don't think there's a need for any such warning, for I feel sure the police will always dodge me as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as the most horrible murderer, which I am, but I could be much worse if I <laughs> wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship with the angel of death. Now, to be exact, at 12.15, earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I'm going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I'm going to make a little proposition for you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music. And I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time that I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, uh, and it is about time I leave your earthly home, I will cease my discourse, hoping that thou wilt publish this, uh, that it may go well with thee. I, I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that has ever existed, either in fact or realm of fantasy. The Axeman. No one died that Tuesday night though there were some accidents, like when a wife attacked her husband because he forgot his key and came in through the window. Uh, he was not seriously hurt. Uh, but other than some accidents, nothing happened. And one thing, and I don't know that I've, I've made room to talk about it anywhere else, so I want to jump it in here real quick, mm -hmm. is that letter, most modern criminologists don't think it's the ax man. Because it's it's the language of an erudite person, hmm. and and the axe man seemed much more business like, down to earth, common common man kind of thing. Fair. So 
Yeah, they, they say that, you know, the Axeman, he was a working man. He, he didn't write this. Yeah, it makes sense. So, on August 10th, 1919, Steve Boca was a grocer who awoke in the middle of the night with a headache. He walked into his bathroom where he realized he had a head wound. He ran to the home of a neighbor where he collapsed from his injuries. He was rushed to Charity Hospital where he was treated while the police examined his home, finding a bloody axe in the backyard and a door panel had been chiseled off as well. Nothing was taken, but Steve could not remember any details of what happened that evening. Can I just say that you must be a seriously heavy sleeper. Yeah. Couldn't remember any details. I woke up. There was pain, then blood. <laughs> I woke up and had a headache. I went to the bathroom and realized I actually had a head fracture. <laughs> um, Sarah Lawman. Mm-hmm. Uh, neighbors had not seen Sarah for some time and so knocked on her door. When she didn't answer, police made their way in and discovered Sarah lying on her bed with a massive head wound and missing several teeth. Mm -hmm. The salient... The assailant? Assailant. Assailant. Damn it. Assailant! There you go. Perfect. Uh, had crawled in through a window and left a bloody axe on, on the front lawn. The woman was taken to the hospital where she recovered, but had no memory of the of the assault. Awful. October 27th, 1919. Uh, final victim, Mike Pepitone. Mike was found covered in his own blood and blood spatter covering his room. Uh, Mrs. Pepitone and her six kids saw and heard nothing. And this was the very last killing attributed to the Axeman. Uh, and from here, we have to talk about the uh, suspects. Mm -hmm. um, there's four-ish. Uh, some of them aren't actual people. Some of them are like kinds of people or types right. of people, you know, but yeah. So, but there's four suspects. Uh, and Krista, I will let you begin with suspects number one, the black hand. Uh, one theory based on the fact, the fact that most of the victims were Italian Americans is that the murders were the work of of the Sicilian 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 black hand a kind of percu per precursor. precursor I'm going to fight these words <laughs> a precursor to the mafia police believe that these families you know, either owned the black hand money or were victims of extortion by the Black Hand, and when they refused to pay, they were attacked and killed. However, most modern investigators believe that the Black Hand had been involved in... There would be far fewer survivors. Fair enough. Yeah, if you're gonna say... If you're gonna hang it on the mob, um, they, they usually don't leave a lot of people alive. Yeah, and this guy, I think... About half, it yeah. seems like, didn't die, yeah. All right. Suspect number two, Joseph Mumphrey and Frank Doc Mumphrey. So, I guess that person went by both of those? Um, yeah, it, it's hard to say because, again, as you read, you'll find out some of this. But, yes, uh, they... One story specifically says that his real name is Frank Doc Mumphrey, but he went by Joseph Mumphrey. I see. Okay. So the only name linked to the Axeman that is this Mumphrey or Mumphrey 
Um, there are several stories here. One that states that Mrs. Pepitone was arrested in Los Angeles for shooting Joseph Malmfrey, a man who led an extortion gang that targeted Italian Americans. According to this story, Mrs. Pepitone recognized him as a man who had left her home the night her husband was murdered. She shot and killed him in retaliation for her husband's death. However, this cannot be supported as no evidence exists of a Joseph Momfrey being shot in Los Angeles in 1920 when this story supposedly happened by Miss Pepitone or anyone else. Further, Miss Pepitone told police that she had seen no one in regards to her husband's attack, so she wouldn't know what the criminal criminal looked like. Another story is that Frank Mumphrey owned a jazz shop club that wasn't doing well until the city, under the threat of violence, began to hire more jazz musicians and buy more jazz music. Many find these theories, frankly, unbelievable. Yep. All right. Suspect number three is copycat. Cat killers, the Axeman had a distinct M.O., however, he rarely, if ever, followed it to the letter. Some think that either, uh, some either used the Axeman as cover for their own crimes, or perhaps was a gang of criminals terrorizing specific neighborhoods. Uh, and uh, plowing on to the end here, fourth suspect is the demon or supernatural killer. This one's my favorite. Mm. Uh not the one I believe most, but my favorite. There were those who believed, and probably some still do, that with the killer's ability to enter buildings, often seemingly to simply appear, or his ability to vanish without a trace, that the killer was exactly what he claimed in the letter to the Times Picayune, the worst spirit that ever lived, in fact, or, or the realm of fantasy. Uh, yeah. And I think that's kind of why that idea bubbled out in American Horror Story is, is kind of because of that thought process and the fact that the season it was in, which was Coven, they, they were saying that the witches had gone up against this guy. And so, it, I mean, it definitely was very, they, de, they took that, Thing that actually happened in history, but they wove it into their storyline world really well. And see, yeah, I didn't realize the accent, even doing the research. Uh, and I should, and part of the problem was, was doing the research for the accent, and I never checked like uh, popular references. Yeah, references. Yeah. And it just, just to see where it, where it had popped up. Mm -hmm. um, I found out that one of my uh, favorite bands, um, Squirrel Nut Zippers, uh, has a song that was written, well, if you believe the mom free story, it was written by the killer. Uh, if you believe anyone else, it was written for him. But uh, mm -hmm. it's called The Axe Man's Jazz, uh, Don't Scare Me Papa. Is yeah. what, yep. And uh, yeah, so... Um, but yeah, it, he he is a breeding ground for a lot of authors, hmm. a and I am not sure that every killing attributed to him was him. Yeah, you know, um, just because like the guy with the money was taken. That's the only one where any money was taken. Everything else, mm -hmm. it wasn't. Why take six or seven dollars? What did he need a bus that night or something? Well, I, six or seven dollars back in 1920 was quite a bit of money, but still, yeah. I'm just saying it okay, yeah, you, you're right. It's probably like 70 or 80 bucks. Yeah, now. still, it's not crazy, but yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I can I yeah, but still. I mean, people usually made what? 25 cents. Yeah. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. yeah. But but still my problem remains is that <sighs> Yeah, is I just I don't know. I don't 
I don't buy that guy, but <sighs> and and I just find it like isn't this happening right around the same time that um that guy with the radar x-ray was finding the lizard city under LA maybe like wasn't that early 20th century like 1908 I, or something like might, that you, you might you might not be too far off and and see like you can that was a thing back in this day and age is that the papers would sometimes cause more problems than they cured by publishing misinformation. Oh, that's definitely true. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, it, that's just crazy to me. So, uh, <coughs> do I have a guess? Yeah. Who do I think he is? I, I honestly don't think... Uh, it, it, I guess the closest thing to my guess would be copycat kill. I think there's one guy who did about a handful of them, and then the rest were all uh, people just trying to ape the MO so they could get away with it, and it looks like they might have done so. Right. But yeah, that, that would be my best guess, because I don't... Right. Any thoughts? She thinks she'd like to sleep. I think I'd like my back to be popped. And I think that I don't think any of what the guesses are are the actual killer. I think he got away with it. I think he died. <laughs> I think he's a dead man now. Well, I mean... Just about a hundred percent positive he's dead now, considering this was over a hundred years ago. Yeah. I mean pretty solid probability. So, yeah, it, like I said, I I'm gonna stick with my copycat guess. What's your where where do you land with him, honey? I I think that I I think that you're probably I feel like you're pretty close on there with the copycat. I think there probably was someone who went out there and and killed those people for whatever reason and then other people were like I want to get rid of so and so. Let's do it this way kind of thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. It it just it, like I said, yeah. And it was just because none of the other theories make sense. Like, and I, and the people that are like, wait, so it was so jazz could get popular. Okay. Work that one out on a map for me. That's how's that, how's that, what kind of brainiac oh. Superman are you to get from point A to point Z on that map? Crazy, crazy. So, yeah, I just, that one just floors me. No, he did it to make jazz music popular, so he'd make a lot of money, see? Nope. <laughs> Is this an episode of Scooby-Doo? What's going on here? <laughs> I would have gotten away with it, except for those, you know, pesky Italians. <laughs> Leave the Italians alone. Yeah. Leave what? the Italians alone, Pookie. What the heck? Well, that was the, the victim, though, that mostly... That Most the of actual... them were Italian-Americans. Leave That's the Italians alone, Pookie. What the heck? Now, she, now she's telling the x man So. So. Yeah, our guess, our, our best our guess. Our guess is as good as anyone else's, I guess, huh? Yep. All, All right. right. That brings us to the end of our show. Yes, it does. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for keeping us in the Good Pods Top 100. Also got an interesting email this week uh, from Carlos at 
pods like us or pods or us or something like that. Uh, we've been near top 200 in uh, true crime in the Saudi Arabian Emirates. So position 175. Yep. So. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks uh, for listening. Uh, those of you who are out there who are, obviously, uh, welcome to the show. I speak no Arabic. I don't think either one of us do. No, that's okay. We're cute. But uh, we're, you're still welcome. You're still part of the fam. Absolutely. So, um, but I got, let's see, I got that out of the way. And, oh, yes, uh, thank the listeners. Uh, thank uh everybody else. Right, right. No, no, that's the where peoples. I'm, all the peoples. Uh, we we thank Paige Elmore and yep. Hey, it, ooh, hey, I got it. I've also got like weird songs running through my head all day. <laughs> Sorry. Like right now, it's uh, that "Come On, Get Happy" by that TV band, Danny. Oh, the Partridge Family. Yeah, yeah, Danny Bonaducci's family there. Yeah. So, alrighty. Um, I'd like to say thanks for keeping us in Good Pods Top 100. Thanks to the new listeners we've got. Thanks for keeping us uh, high on the list of true crime in Saudi Arabia. Sure. Uh, please join our Facebook group. Uh, thanks uh, go out to Bill Barrett for doing our theme music. That last name is spelled B-E-H-R-E-N-D-T. <laughs> Uh, you can also catch Bill as part of one half of the Rusty and Dusty podcast. I believe he is the Rusty half, but uh, it, it's been a minute, so uh, the characters are sort of swippy-swappy in my head. Uh, but yeah, so you can catch him there. Uh, also, he is a musician, so if you need music or if you need someone to perform, he's your guy both ways. You can reach him at Bill Barrett. Uh, at sbcglobal.net. Uh, also, I want to say thanks to Paige Elmore of Reverie Crime Podcast. Uh, our dear friend Paige uh, is not only a great true crime podcaster and one worthy of your time. Yes, for sure. Uh, but she also has a Canva addiction. And she, along with uh, some artwork from her own Krista, uh, did some logo art for us. So thank you, Paige. Thank you, Paige. Also thanks to Aaron Gnurk of the Big Dumb Fun <laughs> Show for continuing to promote us locally. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, join us next week as we look into the Kent State Massacre. Or maybe something else. <laughs> Bye! Bye. Bye. Thank you.